The South African Reserve Bank has attached over a billion rand in assets linked to former Steinoff International CEO Marcus Euster. And this after the Western Cape High Court granted the Reserve Bank an application to attach all assets linked to Euster. Now, the assets estimated at 1.4 billion rand include a house, a wine farm and other possessions that's held in trust. The matter is linked to a case of alleged contravention of the exchange control regulations against Euster. Now, he's also linked to the collapse of Steinhoff due to alleged accounting irregularities. Uh, chartered accountant and political commentator Kaya Sitole joins us now for this conversation. Kaya, good to have you. Welcome to Morning Live. Good morning and good morning to the viewers. Let me first, um, you know, party on your views on this latest unraveling of the events. So I think obviously it is ridiculously overdue. We are almost five years into the very first moment where we discovered on the 5th of December 2017 that Marcus used to have left Steinhoff. It then obviously turned out that he had left on the basis that significant irregularities had been uncovered during that audit process of that particular year. And it took many more years for actually even the forensic auditors to actually figure out what did really happen. So it is almost five years to the day where we actually first heard about this matter and for the Reserve Bank to finally swoop in and say we think there has been a case made for holding on to these assets until at least we figure out what this man actually did. It is a welcome but overdue intervention. So obviously we talk about uh, the terminology here. We talk about accounting irregularities. What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't expect that question. Well, look, it's a plenty term for a fraud. So the key thing here is that when we first heard about this case in 2017, we heard about it from the perspective of the company. And when the company came out and said, look, we cannot publish our accounts at the time that we promised because we think something has gone wrong, they are the ones that coined the term of accounting irregularities. So the reason they framed it as that is that at that point in time, absolutely nobody on the board, with the exception of Marcus Houston, actually had an idea of what it is that they were dealing with. There may have been a very strong suspicion that it was indeed a fraud, but until they actually unpacked those transactions and figure out what it is that they were dealing with, they were hesitant to label it as such. Many months later, once the PwC investigation had been completed, once we then got hold of the SMSs that um, Marcus used to exchange with some of his friends engaging in insider trading, then it became much clearer later on that it was indeed um, a, a massive fraud that had been perpetrated on the company. But the term accounting irregularities sort of stuck out because it was what the company had used to craft the narrative from the inception of the saga. So, um, as you know, a little digression. Uh, this mm. seems to be part of the problem of how we actually frame narratives when it comes to a certain segments of um, the society. So we're talking about accounting irregularities, whereas we should be calling it by its name what it is, fraud, um, large-scale yeah. fraud that was perpetrated. It reminds me of what happened with some of the big construction companies in the country mm. post the 2010 World Cup, where we spoke about collusion. Why is it that sometimes, depending on who we speak about, we fail to call these things by their name? So we have an annual lecture that we do at Vince University with the journalism students, journalism students particularly focusing on why the terms relating to Steinhoff did not use uh, the term fraud from inception. And from our analysis, one of the key problems that we have here is that at the point in time when a matter of this nature first hits the public domain, even those that write about it, even those that have the capacity to sort of, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, lead the public discourse, they at this particular stage actually didn't have the instruments or the insights to understand what it is that was going on. So even prominent writers were hesitant to actually call it a fraud until they sort of had an understanding of what they were dealing with. And because it was the type of transaction or the type of fraud that was concealed in so many ways in that even the forensic report that PwC had come up with has not been made public, a lot of people still say that, look, until I know better, I will simply go with the narrative that the company has sort of given to us. And that's, of course, a very problematic way of doing things. The difference, as you would see, is that when you talk about public sector issues, for example, with the public sector, it is much easier to get access to that information. It is much easier for you and I to sit around the table, dissect it and say, well, clearly this was a contravention of X, Y, Z, so it's a clear outright fraud. 
But in instances where you look at the collusion, as it was called back then, relating to what happened with the stadium tendering, that was a term that was actually linked to what the Competition Commission sort of framed as a crime. So the Competition com the Authorities would say, look, when various bidders or when various companies sit together around the room and then they decide on how the pricing should be structured, that is an element of collusion. Now, of course, that is the beginning of what then amounts to the ultimate fraud. So it is just that particular problem that we have in that depending on where the trigger point is pressed. If the company comes up with a story, they would have already by that point in time hired some PR agents or some PR hacks to craft the story in a manner that sanitizes the extent of the problem. And unless you have people that are able to get hold of the story on their own terms and then say, look, I've looked at the issues, I can tell you what it was, in spite of what the company would like to hear, like us to hear or the, what the company would like us to say, then that seems to be the essence of the problem that you're dealing with here. But yes, eventually they're all at frauds. It's simply a matter of if you have the right PR company that can craft your narrative, a lot of people are going to hold on to that unless they know better. So I'm glad we've uh, clarified that. So coming back to the issue at hand. So for a long time, Kaya, um, many people watching the story and some quite closely um, have been asking how can a case that has been viewed as one of the biggest corporate scandals by any standards uh, seem to be receiving uh, a little uh, to almost no attention from government institutions that were supposed to be in hot pursuit, if nothing else, uh, where people were swindled by uh, this person uh, viewed as one of the best accountants, especially because of institutions like the PIC, uh, the GP, uh, GPF by extension, uh, were impacted. So people actually lost money. So how have we not seen any more action uh, in, on a more pressing basis in this regard? Well, the answer lies in the question because, as you said, that the scale of the fraud, when you talk about hundreds of billions of rand, it simply means that it was something that was remarkably complex. And that complexity transcended the border. So it wasn't just fraud perpetrated in South Africa. It involved other jurisdictions. And what we do know about our law enforcement authorities is that their best intentions notwithstanding, they do not always have the capacity to tackle even the simple crimes that you see. So there's a lot of matter that you'd say are of a smaller scale that still remain unresolved. So when you then talk about something that is so much jurisdictional, it was always going to be a question of do we have the capacity and do we have the resources? That was the first problem. The second issue is that it's probably not altogether accurate to say that, you know, our government agencies haven't done much because this is the type of case that involves multiple players. So what you would do, you would know already is that the JC in particular had powers to deal with the question of, well, you falsified financial statements, so therefore we've done our investigation. That process was completed and Steinhoff and Marcus used to were fined. You also have the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, which then looked at some of the financial transactions and then said, based on the rules that we oversee, there were transgressions here, there was insider trading here, so they themselves have also then finalized their processes and issued a fine. The big issue here seems to be, at the end of the day, all of those would be, it's, I think what the lawyers would refer to as the civil side of things. What we've all been waiting for is actually the outright incarceration of the individual that perpetrated it all. And that is where the NPA comes in. And unfortunately, it is the NPA that is the last great outstanding player. Well, not that they're doing well, but, you know, they haven't done their job. They are the last great ones that we actually are waiting for, for them to be able to say that, look, this is the individual that underpinned all of these other issues that have now been successfully prosecuted by the JSC and by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, and as we now see by the South African Reserve Bank, if they are successful with uh, executing and finalizing this particular preservation order. So it's really the question of the individual himself has not been put behind bars, but a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, matters have actually been dealt with over the past five years by different law enforcement agencies using whatever limited powers they have. And speaking of, if you look at, for example, the role of the banks in all of this, Kaya, do you think that has been sufficiently highlighted, uh, you know, uh, the issuing of fines when people's pensions were at stake here? Uh, are these sanctions that have been imposed, and I, I hear you say that obviously the, there are limits to the sort of um, sanctions that can be imposed by various authorities, but has it been enough for this humongous crime that has happened and the perpetrator is basically hiding in plain sight? I think no one will ever argue that you've done enough because I think the scale of the damage that was done to 
individuals who had invested directly and indirectly into the standoff shares, that is something that you'll probably never recover in any, uh, in any shape or form. So that's the first issue. The second one was, of course, the damage that was done to the integrity of the South African financial system, because you can imagine other people looking outside would say, wait, hold on, this was one of the most prominent companies, this is one of the most prominent stocks in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So you can imagine that if this company could commit such a fraud in plain sight, it calls into question about the usefulness and you know the integrity of the system that are supposed to oversee all of this. So it was remarkably damaging on so many levels. And I think the one part that will probably never get the right uh, result for or the right penalty for, right penalty form is the damage caused to society. So you spoke about, you know, the various sector authorities, but also the NPA in terms of, uh, you know, the criminal part of this proceedings. Now, we know that USA was charged with fraud in Germany last year. And as you said, this has been five years in the making already. So is it acceptable at this stage for us uh, to basically sit back and say, well, it's complex, Five years later, it's still complex and uh, he hasn't been criminally charged in South Africa. And uh, I don't know, from what I've seen, there doesn't seem to be anything on the cards as we speak. Maybe you know better. Well, actually, that is something that should be on the cards because what we do know is that after we kept asking questions from the NPA about why it suddenly went dead on this case, they did come out and say, look, resources just simply are not there. And in order to deal with the resource question, they then entered into a remarkably problematic arrangement with Steinhoff itself, where Steinhoff said they would then make funds available to the NPA in order to enable the NPA to essentially complete the investigation into Steinhoff. So that is unfortunately the last we heard about that particular transaction. So we do not know how much money was eventually sent to the NPA. We do not know what the resources the NPA was then able to employ in order to pursue this case. So until they give us an update, we'll never know that. But there's also the glaring issue here in that this is the one case that the NPA absolutely cannot afford to bundle. So the NPA will, in its own uh, uh, you know, reasoning, take the view that they need to be as methodical as they can in order to ensure that they do not find themselves being exposed in court for having failed to follow some particular due process or having missed a step in this particular prosecution. So we're obviously hoping that that's their thinking because that's the only way to justify this long delay. So if we look at uh, the uh, PIC and um, the PIC uh, last year, I think it was last year, they said that um, the government employee's pension fund portfolio remains financially healthy. Uh, and this is because of uh, its diversified nature. But given what had happened with Steinhoff, given the amount of money that was lost, should people uh, be feeling secure about their pensions at this stage and how they are invested? Look, when it comes to the PIC, the best they can do is essentially put as many safeguards as they can in relation to investing in the South African capital market. So if you are sitting at the PIC today and somebody sort of presented the Steinhoff case study as it was back then, I can guarantee that you would still say, yes, this is a company worth investing in on the assumption that everybody else had done their job. So, of course, by the time the PIC invests in a company on the JSE, there is the expectation that the JSE has done its job because the JSE should have never accepted my company to be listed in this exchange if I haven't done the groundwork of proving that I know how to run the company properly, of proving that the financial statements that are provided are accurate. So the PIC has to rely on the competence of other institutions and other organizations to say, look, if this is the business case that is being put in front of us in relation to a company that's already been vetted by these other agencies whose job it is to vet it, then we do believe that this is worth investing in. So it is still something that will probably recur in one form or another. It's just that the scale of this one was so huge, it made people think that, you know, the integrity of the PIC's investment systems were the problem here. But the reality here is that they can only work with what gets fed to them by the JSC, by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, by the South Reserve Bank and every other plan in the ecosystem. And just finally, Kaya, where is Marcus Euster? In Hermana. So actually, if you visit Cape Town regularly, Marcus Euster 
has stopped doing most things except his passion for horses. So there is actually a bar right next to Parliament that if you go there on a particular evening, you can actually see him because they've got these machines where you do the whole horse gambling thing. So he's been seen. People in Cape Town see him regularly. People in Hamana see him regularly. And as you now know, people in Nanjrat and the wine estate have actually seen him recently. So he's fully healthy. He's alive. He's just like, you know, enjoying his life like you and I. Well, must be nice. But um, we'll park it there, Kaya, and if there are any further developments, of course, we'll come back and talk about that as well. Uh, Kaya Sitole, thank you so much uh, for your time this morning. Uh, Kaya is a chartered accountant and uh, also political commentator discussing the latest developments in former Steinoff CEO Marcus Eustis case uh, where the South African Reserve Bank has attached billions of rands in assets uh, yesterday.